there are going to be Christians in hell. The question is, which Christians are going to be in hell? I know this might come as a surprise to many of you, especially considering knowing what I believe about salvation, but the fact of the matter is, there are going to be Christians, people who call themselves Christians, who are going to be in hell. So let me just reveal to you before I get to this, to this list, what do I mean by Christians? Well, not everyone who calls themselves a Christian is a Christian. There are those who are professed Christians who are false converts who will simply make their way to hell, thinking, however, in the meantime, that they are on their way to heaven. Now, the question is, who are these people? And then even more so, are you or do you know of someone else that might be considered to be in one of these groups? The first group of Christians who are going to find themselves in hell are going to be those that are self-righteous. Those people who think that they are a little bit above everyone else, they tend to notice everyone else's sins, however, never noticing their own. And if you were to show them or to remind them of their sin, well, then what will they do? They will impugn you and look the other way as it regards to them. Jesus says in Matthew 5 that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, then you will in no way enter the kingdom of God. And then in Luke 18, 9, one of the more graphic and better examples to demonstrate this point of self-righteousness is the Pharisee and the tax collector who both go to the temple. But the tax collector would not even look into heaven, but instead would look down, beating, his, beating himself, saying, God, have mercy on me. He knows that he's a sinner. That is a person who is clearly not self-righteous. But the other person who's also at the temple, this tax collector, notice what he says. The Bible says that he stood by himself praying to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, for I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But Jesus makes a notice that this person is not in any way, shape, or fashion anything like this tax collector. One is repentant, the other one is not. One will see heaven, the other will see hell. If you are any way like that, where you notice everyone else's sins and never yours, nor is anyone else allowed to see yours, well then you, my friend, are self-righteous and in danger of going to hell. The second group would be the progressive Christian. These are people who are of the world. These are people who think that what's happening in the world, the world has progressed, has evolved, has become more informed, and so the church should follow suit. You see these people more associated with the LGBTQ community or just sexuality in general. You see these people that are asking that that lifestyle be accepted into the church and it should not be or a lifestyle where marriage and family is not as important. These are people who are adulterers with God, who are friends with the world. And the Bible says that being friends with the world, that's being an enemy with God. They would rather be viewed favorably by the world and by their friends and by society than being viewed positively by God, by the church. They feel as though that maybe the church is on the wrong side of history and to them status or a particular social standing as it relates to our country or any other country is more favorable. For them, the word of God can kind of get in the way. And if you attempt to show the word of God or highlight the word of God, whether it's in their life or lacking, then the first thing that they will do is to say that you are judging. Do not judge me. Well, we know the Bible does not say not to judge, but it says to judge rightly. But they do not want to hear the word of God because the word of God can condemn. These are Christians in name only who will believe that the word of God is not as important as their own feelings. As a matter of fact, they don't want to hear the word of God because it pricks them. It bothers them. It, it reveals to them who they are and they don't like it. And so as less of the word of God as they could possibly hear would be favorable to them. And so if you're one of them, then I can promise you this. You will not find your way in heaven, even though you call yourself a Christian. Now, this last group is probably the largest group. This is the group of people, the Christians who are unrepentant. The Bible knows of no Christian who is not unrepentant, not to say that they have to be perfect. That's not the point. An unrepentant Christian is a person who does not regard or acknowledge their sins. Jesus says, or John says in 1 John 1, 9, that if you acknowledge or if you confess your sins, then Jesus is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. The issue is, do you acknowledge your sin and does sin bother you? A repentant person does sin, but a repentant person is bothered by his sin. 
a repentant person is also bothered by other sin. They don't revel in anyone else's sin. They don't look to watch or to make fun of anyone else's sin. What they would rather do is for their fellow men also, like themselves, is to be as far removed from sin as possible. And that sin grieves them. Why would sin grieve them if they are a Christian? Because the Holy Spirit lives in them. And if the Holy Spirit lives in you, then he's also grieved by sin, which would make you grieved by sin. An unrepentant Christian, and I use that term kind of oxymoronically, an unrepentant Christian can either be deceived or not deceived. He can be intentional or unintentional about his repentance, not really thinking about it, thinking that he's done enough simply by making a prayer of faith, by saying that he's a Christian is good enough. God knows my heart. I can live how I want to live. That can't be. That is a person that is unrepentant. Remember, sin has always been an issue with God. And so a child of God, that would be an issue with him as well. There, there is, however, on the other end of the spectrum, someone who is even worse off than this person, headed to the same location, but worse off. And that is the person who is a intentional sinner. Someone who is a wolf, someone who's a false teacher, someone who's a false prophet, someone who is preying on the lives of these other unrepentant Christians. The Bible says that in the last days, the people will not endure sound doctrine. Well, they have these itching ears, and so necessarily there has to be someone that's going to give them something to tickle their ears. Who will they turn to? One of these false teachers, a false prophet, some wolf, someone who wants to come in and make sport or make merchandise of the body. And there are those in the body who don't mind being made merchandise of because they have these promises that they've been given. They have this hope, this dream in a physical better life, much more so than a spiritual better life. Because they're unrepentant and they are willfully unrepentant because they're after their own these are people who oppose the message of God, which is that we move away from sin and move closer to him. They oppose God. They oppose Christ. They oppose the message. And because of that, they are firmly in the category of anti-Christ, plural, not the anti-Christ, but they oppose God. They are anti-Christ. And so for these people, they help to make up the largest group of Christians who are going to hell. That would be the unrepentant Christians. So we have the unrepentant Christians. We have the progressive Christians and we have the self-righteous Christian. And the truth of the matter is none of them have a relationship with God. None of them know Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 7 that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, these are going to be some of those very same people. And they will say, we've done all these wonderful things. We've prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done all these wonderful things. And what will Jesus' response be? I never knew you. Not that I used to know you. Not that we were once friends, we once knew each other, but then you parted, you walked away. That's not what he's going to say. He's going to say, I never knew you. So even though they looked like, and they would always say, Lord, Lord, they would wear the face, they would wear the hat, they would wear the shirt of a Christian. They would say the words, speak like a Christian, but they're not. Jesus identifies a Christian by calling us sheep. And he says in John 10, that his sheep, his own sheep, know his voice and we follow him. He also goes on to say in verse five that we do not listen to or hear another voice, a strange voice. As a matter of fact, we simply will not listen to, but what we do, we will run away from that stranger or that strange voice. Why? Because it's not his voice. And so if you find yourself going after strange voices, if you find yourself doing things that you're not supposed to be doing and it doesn't bother, there's no repentance in you. If the world makes sense. If sin makes sense, if another religion makes sense, then you, my friend, are not a Christian. And I want you all to understand, I'm not saying this to be mean or ugly or judgmental, but I'm saying this, that out of love, we need to warn those, maybe it's yourself or maybe someone that you know who you don't want to see go to hell, but you want them to come and know the love of Christ. Not that they have to live perfectly. That is not what I'm saying, because there is no Christian ever nor will there ever be, as long as we're on this earth, that will live perfectly, that will live without sin. I'm not saying as an excuse that we can sin. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if you do sin, that doesn't mean that you are not a Christian. What I am saying is that your sin, whatever it is, however often it is, you should be broken over. You should be bothered by it. And so the gospel is that we can just simply place our faith in Christ who has paid the debt for us and then we can live in him. And if we're concerned about that and being with him rather than being here in the world and having the things of the world, well, then you, my friend, are a Christian. 
If that's not you, then I invite you to become one. Amen.